You know, the center, uh, like a lot of disability services, started you know, in the 40s and 50s, and I got into it in the 70s where uh, the big institutions were closing, and a lot of the folks we took out of the institutions were dangerous and traumatized by living with thousands of people unsupervised. So I got a real big start in um, dealing with that issue of trauma associated with food and a lot of other things, and I'll talk how we sort of evolved the center. Um, but we, early on, in the early 80s, we wanted to move away from disability center thinking, which is, you know, I just couldn't stand having my name cerebral palsy. And um, so we moved to Center for Discovery for a while. But I found in my work over these last many decades that you lose the whole person when you go after the label, retarded, CP, autistic. So we're really not, a, we're, I'm sort of anti-advocacy, disability-centric wackies, and I go after the whole person. And so with that, a lot of how the center evolved, we deal with very complex people, the most complex kids and adults in New York State, and some other states send kids to us as well. And we're realizing, particularly in brain regulation, um, I used to say in the early days when I would be opening a house in a community where people were afraid to have disabilities, kids, people with disabilities living next to them, I remember saying about 38 years ago, I go, listen, if you live long enough, you join this club. Now that was 38 years ago, before the onset of all dementia disorders, living so much longer. And, I, and also the prevalence of disabilities in those days was 1 in 10,000, 1 in 30,000. You know, Down syndrome was one of the, the more prevalent, and I think that was 1 in maybe 5, 8,000 if you're over 35 years of age. So it was there, but for the grace of God, you didn't see folks. But now, with the prevalence of autism and all of the Alzheimer's and dementia related for typical aging, you see it everywhere. So I actually had people 38 years later calling me and said, my grandson is autistic and my wife has Alzheimer's and I remember you yelling at us. That, <laughs> they, they basically called me and said, by the way, I've lived long enough, I've joined the club. Yeah. So with that kind of thinking, the center tries to look at the whole person, which really translates to all of us. And you know, we now now have an image of the autistic brain and the Alzheimer's brain, and they're almost identical and they all have the same underlying complexities. So my argument with, with you know, caretaking is, you know, we, we have to almost be like that poker game where we say, we're all in, you know, that we're all on this. And, and if we put all our money together to figure this thing out and not stick it in different spots mm -hmm. for the whole person, um, I think we're gonna go much longer, longer way. I, am I rushing past that? No, not, not at all. I, 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 wanted, I, I visited the center and I want to continue to do so, but I'm just fascinated that your holistic approach from growing your own food to you know, owning parts of the town where everybody has a job and you know, the work you've done with brain and gut connectivity and you know, all that, I think, again, can be a national model. You know, years ago, I, I, even disciplines like PTOT and speech, they weren't what they are today. You know, they were very pedestrian. You know, the OTs worked with firemen who broke a leg and had to get back to work. PTs to be burn patients, speech were speech teachers. Nursing was one of the most holistic trained. So initially our population were very medically fragile. So I was the first in New York to bring nurses in. I had a saying years ago, I never met a nurse I didn't like. And unfortunately, I've never met a social worker I did. <laughs> 38 years later, I have a couple hundred nurses and about four social workers, but uh, well, I'm teasing, I have some nurses. <laughs> um, but I realized that the, the paradigm shift that had happened back then for caregivers were you had to move from caring for sick people to making people healthy. And the first thing when you think of that is food. You know? so, and I was having kids rejecting antibiotics, so we started our farming operation in the early 80s. And now we grow food for about 1,900 meals a day, 
biodynamically, so we're like pretty hip and food stuff. <laughs> when I first did it, initially, the, the institutional people said, oh, you're going to build farms just like they did 100 years ago, and I, I know this is going to be a hip farm. And now it's, we're pretty hip with that, that kind of thing. We, we, we trademarked food as medicine, so food is a big deal. Uh, particularly, that was developed for kids who were medically fragile, who really had to pounded a lot of antibiotics, so we didn't want to bring anything in through food, particularly through meat. And I was telling the folks from Texas that we brought in one of the first big herds of Kenina cattle, which is this big Tuscan cow, because it's very lean meat, but they just brought it back from Lyndon Johnson and all those cow people. But we now grow food for a lot of people. Um, and, and we have a big research institute with food. We're looking at obesity and stuff, and particularly in the autism population now. We see one of their big underlying issues is a real bad gut disorders and a lot of autoimmune dysfunction inside the gut. And they are, they're, they're working on trauma all the time because they're, they're sort of caught up in fight flight all the time. And a lot of similarities in dealing with trauma sleep deprivation, all the other kinds of things that we're working on. And that's what brought us to the 82nd Airborne. You know, we do work with um, uh, World Team Sports initially for physically disabled, disabled vets. But now, in the last year or so, we have a relationship with the 82nd where we actually take active troops in and we work them through, uh, you know, exercise and healthy food and conversation and in that process, I'm realizing a lot of the, the soldiers would come to me that I have a child with autism and, you know, when I'm deployed, my wife is in so much, you know, stress over it. So we're trying to help the Army get a, more attention to that kind of issue that's right in everybody's face and they're just not getting, getting after it. So exercise, we have a big research institute and we're looking at brain health and we see the brain health. Physical activity is so important too. So, John Brady from Harvard and Bessel and some of these other cats, we're doing all kinds of physical activities for treatment that we're really finding to be very successful. With kids. I'm also aware of the uh, the New Children's Hospital and Research Institute. Yes, the idea is to really create a treatment model that's in real time, urgent and with the family and the school district so that right now in New York, and I think it's here too, that once a kid uh, gets thrown out of the system, they get placed like lifelong, and we're going to try to really put an urgent care model in place. And with that, we have a major research institute that's going after a bunch of things with complex disorders, particularly we've just launched a medicinal marijuana study for the track of the seizures, we're growing with the U.S. Ag Department, with our big farming operation, we're growing hemp to really try to see if growing it biodynamically, can we get a better CBD oil that's pure. You know, it's interesting about medicinal marijuana and even hemp. There's no regulations for pesticides and all kinds of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you're forced to grow inside, all kinds of nasty things happen. So we've, we have the federal I get I get flyovers from the federal ATF all the time to make sure I don't have anybody migrating into my hemp fields. But the medicinal marijuana study is going to be really important. And I know out here you guys are using a lot of marijuana for behaviors and things like that. My big worry with that because I I intuit that this is good, this is some good stuff. But there's really no one's ever done any dosing studies, so this is going to be the first really give physicians and moms and dads a better understanding of dosing, or else this remarkable possibility is just going to go to hell if a couple of kids die. So that's sort of a, a quick take on the show here. And um, I guess... No, and, and I, I, I would argue if you are going to be a national model, you really need to be open source. So, so yeah. a lot of that data that you're collecting, being the ability to share that nationally yeah, with my, in my engineering department, we, we designed a, uh, something with Google, since you know, I have a relationship here with the Google people out here. And we worked on a platform that was developed by 
actually a physical education teacher and clinicians talking about open source right. that in a relationship with Google we have to open source this but it's a it's a like a hoverboard platform that weighs about 35 pounds that a manual wheelchair and a lot of vets are checking this out right now can roll up on click in and power it's a pretty sexy thing to, uh, <laughs> called indigo and so you'll be seeing that and Airbus may take it as a people mover. But it was developed in some of our vets and some of the kids who, a, 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 a power wheelchair on average costs about $18,000 and we can develop this for under two. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna be a developing world kind of event, but we think the vets are gonna love it because it, it's quick. And it, it has really, it's gotta be sexy. <laughs> yeah. Boom, they're in it. And so that's something that the center is attempting. The, the center is attempting to take. I have the smartest staff on earth. I mean, I, I have 1,700 staff, and they are literally the best people on the planet. So I'm looking to market the hell out of them around the planet. And this is starting what we're attempting to do. And that's why I guess I'm here in California. Now, now, the only other thing I mentioned is I know the tech companies are under assault right now in Washington, but they, they do a lot of good as well. And I know uh, Michael Rosen, for example, and I both worked uh, for Autism Speak, Speaks, and uh, there was a partnership uh, with, with Google and Autism Speaks where they were able to map 10,000 human genomes to really get a better understanding of the spectrum of autism. And frankly, it's because NIH couldn't do it. They just didn't have the, the computing capacity. So that money was raised privately, nevertheless, but it was open source and shared. And, some tremendous innovations that are occurring because of that, that initial research. The last thing on moms and dads who haven't slept in seven years, and, and this is the other thing that I was hoping would come out of this, is usually trauma people and I, are, although Bessel is a good friend of mine, we're not at the same pace and we have to start getting together on this stuff to really get this all in thing, and particularly with stigma. See, my work, you know, came out of dealing with people who were not considered human. They were called vegetables. They were taken from their family at birth, and the family accepted the, the state to say, this is too complicated. Neurologists would often say, he won't know who you are, put him away. And I walked into these institutions, and I still, I'm, I'm still, I go to work every day to fight. And because it's so close to coming back, if it's not already here, when we run into a problem that we don't understand, it's so easy to name it and then lock it up. And we have to be very careful. This is a very important time for all of us to get after it. You know, the new R word is demented. All of a sudden, you're demented, you're dead. That's not the case. We can work and help people with brain dysregulation. So, we really have to get ready for this part because we're running into, if you look at the room, we've got a lot of people with complex issues and we've got to see the person, not the name. And I think we do that, we're going to go a long way.